Welcome to Dermatology Explained. Today's video is focusing on the next component of our series on autoimmune bullous disorders. In particular, we'll be discussing the desmoglein compensation hypothesis and how it relates to pemphigus vulgaris and pemphigus foliaceus. Just as a recap, this is a lovely diagram and schematic from Dr. Stephen Chen, who often posts extremely insightful and useful tweets online with regards to dermatology topics. If you haven't come across his profile before on Twitter, I highly recommend you check it out. And in his posting here, we've got a schematic of two keratinocytes, and they're interacted with each other by these junctions known as desmosomes. There's also an interaction between the keratinocytes and the basement membrane with hemidesmosomes. Within the desmosomes, as we've already previously discussed in our other videos, there are multiple molecules which can act as potential targets for different bullous disorders. Some of the key ones in the desmosome include desmoglein 1 and 3, but there's also desmocolon, placoglobon, and desmoplacin. Within the hemidesmosomes, there are other targets such as BPAG1, BPAG2, plectin, integrin, collagen 7, and laminin, and those are the targets often seen in subepidermal bullous disorders. In terms of pemphigus foliaceus, its key target is desmoglein 1. Pemphigus vulgaris mucosal form, key target is desmoglein 3. And in pemphigus vulgaris mucocutaneous form, the main targets are desmoglein 3 and desmoglein 1. So what are some questions about different forms of pemphigus? These questions include, why is the blister in pemphigus foliaceus superficial compared with pemphigus vulgaris, which tends to be deeper? Why are oral lesions present in pemphigus vulgaris, but not in pemphigus foliaceus? And thirdly, why do some pemphigus vulgaris patients only have oral involvement, whereas some other cases have both oral and skin involvement? To address these questions, in 1999, doctors Amagai and Stanley proposed desmoglein compensation hypothesis theory based on the distribution of desmoglein 1 and desmoglein 3 in the skin and mucosa. And this concept has become the landmark concept to explain the questions on the previous slide. And it states that any one of the desmoglein types is sufficient to maintain the integrity of the epidermis and mucosa. In terms of the distribution of the desmoglanes, there is a difference in the pattern of expression of DSG1 and DSG3 between the skin and mucosal membranes. In the skin, DSG1 is expressed throughout the epidermis. However, it is more intensely expressed in the superficial top layers of the epidermis. DSG3 is expressed in the lower portion of the epidermis, primarily in the basal layer and just above it. In the mucosa, however, both DSG3 and DSG1 are expressed. However, all throughout the mucosal layer, DSG3 expression is predominant over DSG1. So this is represented here in the schematic. On the top, we can see here are the different skin layers. And on the right-hand side is a diagram which demonstrates the level of expression. And we can see here that both DSG1 and DSG3 are expressed in the skin. DSG1 is predominantly expressed in the superficial layer, whereas here there is minimal DSG3 expression. In the lower layer of the skin, however, there is a predominance of DSG3 expression compared with DSG1. In the mucosal membrane areas, all throughout it, DSG3 expression dominates over DSG1. This pattern of expression of DSG1 and DSG3 is the crux to understanding the Desmos gland compensation theory. So we will now use this theory to explain the presentation of various forms of pervigus. In pervigus foliaceus, as we already know, it has autoantibodies which target desmoglein 1. Desmoglein 1 expression dominates in the superficial layers of the epidermis, whereas desmoglein 3 has minimal expression here. Therefore, when you have autoantibodies which target desmoglein 1 here, the skin is affected, it results in acantholysis, and you get a split in the superficial surface. In the deeper layers of the epidermis, there is 
ample Desmoglein 3 expression, which compensates for any Desmoglein 1, which is targeted by autoantibodies. In contrast, in the mucosal membrane, there's ample DSG-3 expression all throughout, and this compensates for any loss of DSG-1 via autoantibodies. Similarly, we also see superficial blisters in other conditions, including bullous impetigo and staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, because in these conditions, the toxin produced targets and cleaves predominantly DSG-1. In mucosal dominant pemphigus vulgaris, the target is desmoglein 3. Autoantibodies against desmoglein 3 will interrupt the function of the mucosal membrane because this is the dominant protein that is expressed throughout the mucosal membrane layers, and DSG, DSG1 is not able to compensate. Whereas in the skin, there is ample DSG1 compensation all throughout, and therefore there is minimal cutaneous or skin findings in this form of pemphigus vulgaris. Third case, mucocutaneous form of pemphigus vulgaris. In this form of pemphigus vulgaris, they contain autoantibodies against both DSG-1 and DSG-3. Therefore, all throughout the skin and all throughout the mucosal membrane, the uh, DSG-1 and DSG-3 function is affected, and therefore you get both deep skin blisters as well as mucosal erosions. Armed with the knowledge now of the desmoglein compensation theory, we'll go back to the original questions we posed at the start of this presentation. Why is the blister in pemphigus foliaceus superficial compared with pemphigus vulgaris, which has deeper blisters? The reason is that in pemphigus foliaceus, it targets DSG1, which is expressed mostly in the superficial epidermis. And in this layer, there is minimal compensation by DSG3, which causes acantholysis as well as splitting in the superficial surface of the epidermis. In contrast, in pemphigus vulgaris, which targets DSG3, Three, this is predominantly expressed in the lower epidermis and as well as all throughout the mucosa. As such, the affected skin will be deeper blisters. For the second question, why are oral lesions present in pemphigus vulgaris but not pemphigus foliaceus? The reason is that in pemphigus vulgaris, we target DSG3 and it is DSG3 that is expressed predominantly in mucosal surfaces and as a result, erosions form in this area. In pemphigus foliaceus, the target is DSG1. DSG1 in the mucosa is amply compensated by DSG3, and therefore we see no oral lesions with pemphigus foliaceus. Well, the third question, why do some pemphigus vulgaris cases have only oral involvement compared with some other pemphigus vulgaris cases which involve both oral and skin findings? The reason being is that some pemphigus vulgaris cases only target DSG3, and in these cases, you see only oral lesions and in some other pemphigus vulgaris cases, it targets both DSG3 and DSG1, and therefore you have mucocutaneous findings for both. I hope you've enjoyed this video presentation focusing on the desmoglein compensation theory and its relevance to pemphigus vulgaris and pemphigus foliaceus. If you found this video useful, please check out our YouTube channel, Dermatology Explained, for other similar videos. We look forward to meeting again next time.